Welcome to the AMA Steps Forward webinar series. Um, and let me introduce who will be with us today. I'm Dr. Marie Brown, an internist here in Chicago, and I'll be moderating. I also am the Director of Practice Redesign at the American Medical Association and past governor for the American College of Physicians here in Illinois. We'll be joined by Laura Zimmerman, uh, a dear colleague and a fantastic division chief of general internal medicine at Rush University, uh, who has also worked tirelessly on the west side of Chicago addressing uh, inequities and social determinants of health, also in FQHCs. Uh, also, Rachel Smith, our program manager for social determinants of health and health equity at Rush University Health System. Robin Golden will also be available for Q&A, our Associate Vice President of Social Work and Community Health at Rush University Health System. So welcome to you all. Uh, you may find that on, uh, on this platform, you can speed it up so that if you're exercising when you listen to the recording um, or eating, uh, we're all about trying to save time. Hopefully you're taking a cup of coffee if you're listening live. And again, welcome for joining us. I'm gonna have I'm going to hand this off now uh, to Dr. Zimmerman. Welcome, Dr. Zimmerman. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us uh, do this presentation. Um, and we can move to the next slide. Great. So today we're going to be talking about social determinants of health, and we're going to be presenting both the Steps Forward Toolkit uh, that the AMA has put together and is available on the StepsForward.org website uh, for everyone. Um, as well as some of our um, Rush University Health System uh, story as it relates to how we are as a system addressing social determinants of health. So first we'll define social determinants of health. Next we'll discuss why it's so important for institutions to address social determinants of health. Um, we will talk about the impact of social determinants of health on health outcomes. Um, next, we'll talk about incorporating social determinants of health into your practice. We'll talk about exploring needs in your communities, your patients, formulating a plan to begin addressing these needs, and tools to screen for SDOH, as well as connect your patient to resources. At the end, we'll save time for discussion and questions. Next slide. So what are social determinants of health? Well, the formal definition is the conditions, social determinants of health are the conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, age, and the wider set of forces and systems that shape the conditions of daily life. Examples of social determinants of health, many of us are familiar with. It could be the number of grocery stores or food options in the area. It could be local housing policies, access to quality, or excuse me, access to affordable housing. It could be the quality of the education system. It could be air quality. It could be other policies like minimum wage standards. Um, there are very there are very many definitions of social determinants of health. Um, this one comes from Healthy People 2020, um, and it breaks it down into five of the common domains of social determinants of health on which many frameworks are are um, built. Um, but bottom line, we all know that these things external to the clinic walls have a huge impact on our patients' health and their health outcomes. Um, next slide, and I'll turn it over to Rachel. So the question is, why do we address social determinants of health? And addressing social determinants of health is important for improving health and reducing our longstanding disparities in health and health care. This diagram shows, basically breaks down uh, the factors, whether they're socioeconomic, physical environment, health behaviors, or health care that impact people's health. Next slide, please. So this is a slide that shows a number of very specific um, domains that fall within these different areas. So for example, economic stability could include employment, income, expenses, debt, medical bills, and support. These factors or these domains, including the neighborhood and physical environment, education, food, community and social context, and healthcare system can impact health outcomes, such as mortality, morbidity, life expectancy, 
health care expenditures, health status, and functional limitations. Next slide, please. So at Rush, we recognize that we need to measure uh, the types of disparities and the types of factors that impact people's health. Um, we take a look at national uh, measures such as the CMS proposed rule on social determinants, uh, measures and details located on US News and Vizient and others, um, as well as taking a look at NCQA definitions of HEDIS measures and accreditation. At Rush, we're also looking at Z codes that capture social determinants of health and their impact on payment and risk adjustment. We recognize that data is a critical component of helping us determine and address and mitigate social determinants of health. Next slide, please. So this slide defines or describes our performance improvement plan when we focus on patient-focused equity measurement. We're taking a look at all factors such as our demographic data accuracy, collecting real, which is race, ethnicity, and language data, as well as SOGI, sexual orientation and gender identity data. We're also taking a look at social determinants of health data, as well as quality, access, and experience outcomes. Next slide, please. One way that we're using our data is making it actionable by creating data visualization dashboards. This is an example of one that we use at Rush University Medical Center in which we identify and created a target for this past fiscal year of screening 25,000 patients across our hospital and health system. So this dashboard allows us to review the volumes of screening, where screening is located or happening, uh, the most frequent screening in particular zip codes, specifically on the west side, but in all areas, the race and ethnicity of patients that are screening positive, as well as the types of needs that are identified. We're currently working on this the data visualization dashboard to include things such as closed loop referrals, whether appointments were made and kept. We're adding our community health worker efforts to make sure that we capture their impact, as well as creating other filters for other clinical outcomes. Next slide, please. We're also taking a look at ambulatory quality as it relates to equity. This is an example of one such page where we have a centralized equity dashboard where we have specific focus areas. We've, we have filters for, again, race, ethnicity, language, age, payer, zip code, and social determinant. We're also taking a look at maternal health, access, and patient experience. Those are also in development to be able to review and share and communicate this information broadly. Next slide. I'll turn it back over to Dr. Zimmerman. Great, thank you, Rachel. So that's a great overview of some of the institutional level efforts going on around data collection um, and how we're sort of refining our efforts around SDOH. Um, I wanna bring it back to a clinic level because I know a lot of the people here um, are also clinicians. Um, so I wanted to bring to light this case study. And this actually, this happened right before the pandemic and actually happened before we were systematically screening for SDOH in our clinic. And I wanna bring this up because I think um, it just speaks to the fact that a systematic approach is really necessary and just how important SDOH screening and linkage to resources is. Um, so this patient was following up in resident clinic. It was actually the first time that I, I met her um, she identifies as a black woman. She's an adjunct professor of English at a local college. And um, she had been experiencing a 30 pound weight loss, um, 30 pound unintentional weight loss over the year um, prior to our meeting. And chart review showed that um, she, you know, she, her vital signs had consistently been normal. Um, her BMI was 18 at the time that I met her. 
physical exam over the year had been notable at times for end expiratory wheezing. Um, she'd had an extensive workup, much of, I mean, there's probably more that I don't have listed here, but essentially lab work was normal. Um, imaging had been normal, including chest x-ray pelvic ultrasound and CT abdomen pelvis, um, CT chest abdomen pelvis. And then diagnostic procedures, um, EGD and colonoscopy had also been normal. When I saw the patient, um, I asked if she was having any difficulty um, obtaining food, accessing food, or if she was running out of funds or resources before, um, you know, paycheck to paycheck, and whether or not she was ever worried about whether she would be able to afford food. And it turned out that she was actually, because she's an adjunct professor, um, she was actually not, um, she, her income was below the federal poverty level. Um, and so it turned out that actually this weight loss was a result of not having access to food. And so we referred her to our care management and social work um, colleagues, and they did um, get her a link card, they got her food assistance, and they also got her, um, they were able to give her referrals to food pantries. Um, the next time we saw her, she had gained about five pounds and it was doing very well. Um, and this just illustrates, you know, I could see you know, this was a resident clinic and I could see the light bulbs going off with my trainees. You know, I could just see them realizing that this was actually the underlying cause of this person's unintentional weight loss. Um, and food insecurity, I mean, it's, it's not uncommon. Um, you know, food insecurity affects about 13% of all U.S. households. Um, that, raise it, that rises to 20% of black non-Hispanic households. Um, I think what was really a red herring here was the fact that she was an adjunct professor. And so um, people just assumed that she, she must be doing fine and she must not have any social determinant of the health needs. Um, so again, I think this just illustrates um, that a systematic approach is really necessary. Next slide. And I just wanted to put up here again, um, for Rush, you know, we're sort of at this second level in terms of how we're addressing SDOH, but we actually have a Veggie RX program. And since before, so this came before we were even screening for social determinants of health within the clinic. Now we're not only screening, we're linking people to community resources and we're even starting to fill in some of the gaps that we've identified in terms of the community resources. We've actually opened up our, our own pantry, our own food pantry that has a lot of um, actually fresh fruits and vegetables um, in one of the buildings where the majority of our primary care patients are seen. Next uh, slide. So I wanna take this back to, um, to the clinic level again. Uh, we're gonna talk here about a whole range of activities regarding um, social determinants of health. So how to get started, right? Like whether you're one physician or one clinic getting started, all the way up to sort of a comprehensive system-wide approach, these steps can help you uh, make it happen. Um, so the first step, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. First step is going to be understanding and engaging your community. Um, so one way to do this is to start off with the community health needs assessment for your organization. So any federally tax exempt hospital system or health system needs to have one of these. And it is mandatory to do it every three years. Um, they're typically shared publicly, they're posted on the hospital's website. And so this is a great place to get started. If your organization does not have a community health needs assessment to help you understand and engage your community, you can start smaller. You can survey patients, you can survey providers. Um, you can even make this a learner project, right? You could actually have a student or a resident do um, medical record review in the EHR. Next slide. The second step is to engage key leadership. And the real, the real key to this is identifying a return on investment, right? Because even the most altruistic nonprofit organization, right, is going to need to know if they're investing resources in something like an initiative to address SDOH, what is the return, right? There's no mission if there's no margin, as they say. Um, so one real world case, um, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine Catalyst, 
um, actually looked at a pilot project in Houston amongst people with housing insecurity. They looked at 39 patients who had either 10 ED visits or four or more admissions to the hospital. Um, they employed a care coordination intervention to address social needs, and they did a pre-post analysis six months before and six months after the intervention. ED visits went down by 64% and healthcare costs went down by 55% for this group of 39 people, reducing the cost by $1.3 million. Um, so this is a really powerful narrative with supporting data to present to the leadership. And, um, and Rachel, you were, you, um, maybe you can share with us some of the, um, the strategies that Rush has used to do this. Certainly. So uh, Rush actually conducted multiple PDSAs or Plan Do Study Act pilots um, in order to demonstrate our, the value of social determinant screening and navigation. One example is um, a supportive housing pilot that we conducted over the course of a, about a year and a half where we focus on patients who have been identified as low acuity but high utilizers of emergency department services. Um, they also had complex chronic illnesses and were and met the HUD definition um, of homelessness. Um, and so this pilot, although it was a small but mighty pilot, the results of that pilot showed significant cost avoidance for the hospital in unnecessary admission. So while these are individuals who continue to experience complex chronic illnesses, um, we saw a a difference in how they utilize the health system. We also saw the stabilization of those individuals by simply providing them housing and support. So this was one of our great examples of how to conduct a small scale pilot to show big impact in order to engage our key leadership. Next slide, please. Oh, Dr. Zimmerman, did you wanna continue with that slide? No, you can go ahead. Okay, wonderful. So another process that we conducted and we recommend is to assess your readiness. Um, utilizing the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine, um, health systems can adopt these strategies to prevent and address social risks. Um, and so we, we, we use this taxonomy and framework to organize the evidence about how systems address social risk factors. And these five A's are what uh, were recommended, which are awareness, which identifies activities that identify the social risk and act assets of defined patients and populations. This is usually the entry point, and this is what others could happen all the time at the same time or be taken on in any order. Adjustment, activities that focus on altering clinical care to accommodate identified social barriers. Assistance, activities that reduce social risk by providing assistance in connecting patients with relevant social care resources. Alignment, activities undertaken by healthcare systems to understand existing social care assets in the community, organize them to facilitate synergies and invest in and deploy them to positively affect health outcomes. An example of that might be investing in community ride sharing or time bank programs. And last but not least, advocacy. Activities in which healthcare organizations work with partner social care organizations to promote policies that facilitate the creation and redeployment of assets or resources to address health and social needs. An example of that might be work to promote policies that fundamentally change the transportation infrastructure within the community. Next slide. Great, so, um, so this is step four. Um, step four is selecting and defining your plan. Um, so again, bringing it back to even just a practice level, right? One clinician or one clinic. Um, we suggest actually selecting a social need, choosing a health outcome to track and defining a target patient population. The idea here is that you would actually choose um, using the plan, do, study, act um, paradigm, um, you would actually choose a very narrow focus 
um, for your first project or your first attempt at um, screening and linking people to resources for social determinants of health. Um, so this is just an example of a federally qualified health center in their practice, they decided that the social determinant of health they were going to uh, focus on would be insecure, food insecurity. Um, their metric, um, they were going to look at the percent of patients reporting food insecurity. You might also, um, you might also choose, um, you know, perhaps your metric is actually going to be like follow through on referrals, or maybe it's going to be a patient survey but basically deciding a priori, what is the study part, right? What is, what are you going to be tracking? And then, like I said, a narrow focus for the target patient population. Um, so this might be something that a small practice does um, at a left, a next level organization rather, like a hospital or an academic center, you know, perhaps you would, as I alluded to earlier, you might actually screen, refer, navigate, develop new services like our food pantry where you identify gaps um, and contribute to community development, right, to fill those gaps as well in the longer term. Um, good, next slide. So step five, um, you wanna determine how you're going to assess the social determinant of health that you're focused on at the patient level. And these are a group of free um, validated evidence-based screening tools that care teams can access and use. Um, so the PREPARE, um, I won't go through too much detail on these. The links are actually available in the SDOH toolkit on the AMA Steps Forward website. Um, but PREPARE was actually sponsored by the National Association of Community Health Centers. It's a national standardized patient risk assessment tool and um, the templates can actually be used with a variety of EHRs so they can be embedded. Um, the Everyone Project was actually formulated by the Academy of Family Physicians, the AAFP. Um, it's a toolkit that includes a description of team-based approach to screening, along with supporting resources and tools to help family physicians plan next steps. Um, the Accountable Health Communities Health-Related Social Needs Screening Tool um, was actually put together by CMS. Um, it addresses things like housing instability, food insecurity, transportation difficulties, utility assistance, and uh, interpersonal safety. And then the Oregon, the Oregon Community Health Information Network um, was actually um, put together by a nonprofit health information network. Um, and it was, um, it's been utilized in community health centers as well. And then SIREN is a network of various tools and data, data that have been collected um, and can also be leveraged for things like projecting um, return on investment. Um, next slide. And this is just an example of how we embedded it into Epic here at Rush. Um, so we actually have the SDOH screener as part of the rooming protocol. Uh, and it, this, you can see here how it's, how it's embedded in Epic. Um, we also actually, when patients are, when they're signing up for their appointments, right? If they're scheduling their appointment, when they get their reminders, um, there's an opportunity actually to screen via my chart. There's also an opportunity to be screened at the front desk. Um, we're actually ordering kiosks so that patients would be able to um, basically utilize a tablet at the kiosk to do this, um, um, confidentially and in privacy in the waiting area. And then if, if the patient has not been screened at any of those opportunity points, uh, we do have it, um, we do have it embedded in the medical assistant rooming protocol. So at that point, we would hopefully, um, have screened everyone. Next slide. So once you screen patients, it's incredibly important to link them to resources. And again, this is the idea behind 211 is, you know, if you're starting small, right, what can one doctor do? What can one clinic do? You can still make a big impact. Um, this is actually the Federal Communications Commission um, nationwide service. And so by calling 211, 
people have access to um, essential community service programs. So they cover things like food banks, shelters, job training, basic education, transportation, child care. Um, and if you call 211 where you're at and you and it doesn't work, there is actually a call211.org website and you can go there to get the local number. Um, you can also email them and link people to resources that way. Um, next slide. At Rush, we have the linkage embedded in our EHR system. So once somebody screens positive for one of the social determinants of health, um, the Z codes are entered through this order smart set. Um, and then also you can request um, ambulatory care management. So our care management and social worker um, colleagues can take, take it from there um, and contact the patients. Um, next slide. We've also contracted with um, a, an organization, a company called NowPow, which was originated by one of the um, one of a, an investigator at University of Chicago um, that did a lot of geocoding and neighborhood mapping. Um, and so we contract with NowPow so that we can link people to appropriate community resources based on their zip code and their needs. Next slide. So I'll hand it over to Rachel to talk a little bit more about sort of that next level linkage and a comprehensive approach to SDOH, given that those who have one social determinant of health need often have many. Thank you, Dr. Zimmerman. So we use this framework to drive our evaluation activities. Um, primarily, we're focused on identifying the unmet social needs, addressing those unmet social needs in order to improve outcomes. And so this framework just basically explains uh, exactly how our processes work. So obviously patients are experiencing those needs. We conduct our screening, we identify those needs, and then we refer to social services to address. Um, that in turn will increase the connection to resources, decrease those unmet social needs, improve adherence for appointments and medications, um, making sure that we're also focused on reducing those competing demands. So obviously increasing the resources of time, money, and energy for patients, less life chaos, improved well-being, and decreased stress in order to drive to those clinical outcomes. So for example, we mentioned diabetes control, hypertension control, control, excuse me, um, health status and well-being, preventable hospitalizations, lowering costs, and focused on health equity. Next slide, please. Great, so step seven, elevate and, or excuse me, evaluate and refine. So Rachel started to um, touch upon this as well. Um, again, if you're in the clinic, if, it's, if you're um, starting out and you're sort of starting small, um, you want to definitely elicit team feedback. You want to elicit patient feedback. If you can look at outcomes, even if it's EHR review or medical record review, um, you want to do that. Um, and you may do things like measure the frequency of screening, the frequency of intervention, or the actual impact on outcomes. And then the idea is to take that um, feedback, take that data, and act right, refine your intervention, and then start all over again. Next slide. And then last, but certainly not least, don't forget to celebrate your successes. So uh, share patient stories, recognize champions and supporters, um, share best practices with colleagues in other clinics in your organization or even in your region. Um, one thing that I think gets overlooked um, often is the opportunity to disseminate your work, um, celebrate that way, submit abstracts to professional conferences, um, you know, get learners involved, get your residents involved, your medical students involved, um, and kind of take this project to the next level um, in terms of dissemination. Next slide. So here we just have some pearls to wrap up. Um, these are at the end of the toolkit. So you wanna be thoughtful in determining your target population for intervention, um, especially if you have limited resources or no additional resources, you wanna be you know, basically laser focused 
Um, you want to start small and have a very defined, um, you know, targeted, specific, um, and focused effort. You want to take the time to adequately develop and train team members to address um, social determinants of health. So, um, so one thing to consider is understanding implicit bias, um, and that can be critical to ensuring um, open and productive communication with the patients um, from all backgrounds. I think we also have to be mindful that some of our staff may actually be experiencing some of the social determinants of health that we are screening for and are interacting with patients in that context as well. Um, and then building and sustaining strong partnerships with external stakeholders as well. So where are you referring people? Where are you linking people up? Um, and can you use this for visibility and for um, motivation to change local policy? Next slide. And of course, at the end of the day, in terms of uh, joy in practice and sustainability in clinical practice, the principal driver of physician satisfaction is delivering high quality patient care. And so, um, yes, addressing social determinants of health benefits our patients, um, but it also benefits us as clinicians. Um, next slide. Great, and then again, just to highlight that the AMA Steps Forward website has a variety of different um, toolkits to address various aspects of practice transformation and practice sustainability. And with that, um, we can go to the next slide and we can take questions. Well, that was a lot to cover, uh, Rachel and Dr. Zimmerman in 30 minutes, and we do have now great time for uh, Q&A. Um, and I think that it really highlights that Rush is a leader in this space and, and you and uh, uh, Robin Golden and David Ansel and the leadership at Rush has done a fantastic job. We just need to spread, um, as you said, what you've done and you can start small. I know when I was just beginning to learn about SDOH, it was news to me, sadly, that 211 was available. Uh, I said, why didn't I know about this? And it's free, it's across, I tried it myself and sure enough, a human answered. Uh, sometimes in, around a large urban area, they'll send you to a different number just because of the volume there. Um, and I remember being on staff at Rush, uh, to your point of tell the story, I had a, a young woman come in um, for I think just probably health maintenance, a pap smear or something, and she had scrubs on. And I said, oh, you're, you're one of us. Uh, and she said, no, but not for long. And I said, what? She said, well, I'm a dental assistant, uh, but I'm living on, on, on my aunt's couch and she's moving. So I'm going to be homeless and I won't have a place to shower. So I'll probably lose my job. And you can imagine if you didn't have some support to, you know, how would that make you feel um, as the provider? And fortunately, Rush has been ahead of this, and um, I was able to make a referral right then and there. Um, and then they called her, um, I think, actually, while she was in the office, uh, to a sister. So it was um, wonderful to have it right, right there on site. And I think that a lot of people listening, Dr. Zimmerman, would like to know a little bit more about your workflow. Uh, if you click that, you identify a need, and then the provider uh, orders it, then what happens? Uh, can you can you tell us a little bit more about what you have in place? Sure, absolutely. So it goes to the care management team and it does get triaged. We do have um, social workers and care managers assigned to each of our clinics. Um, and so they typically reach out to the patient and will go through the various resources that we have. Um, one thing that's been challenging with that is we don't always have the bandwidth for the social worker or the care manager to be like physically there, right there in clinic. And so we do have, um, you know, sometimes we run into a situation where it's hard once the once the patient leaves the clinic, it's actually very hard to get a hold of them on the phone. Maybe their minutes are up for the, for the month. Um, and so what we've done um, in terms of that is, you know, we try to um, have the patient schedule a follow-up appointment with us before they leave the clinic 
And then um, we can actually notify the social worker who is assigned to our clinic that when the patient will be there next. And then, and then we try to engage them um, at that time. Um, but overall, it's been a very, very successful program. Fantastic. And I think the other important thing that's new over the past few years is that uh, identifying a, a social determinant of health need um, is recognized um, in coding uh, to make it a more complex, uh, so it's, all, it's not difficult to meet a 99214, because this does take time uh, and recognized and it's valued uh, so that we are encouraged to do it. And a lot of people aren't aware that that, that, that is available, um, so I'm glad you highlighted that. Um, but time is of the Dr. essence Brown, here too. Dr. Go Brown, ahead. Can I add to Dr. Zimmerman for a moment? Sure. So not everyone may have the social worker and care manager resource uh, like Dr. Zimmerman does, and we do here at Rush. And really when we started out with this model, we also thought about the importance of any primary care physician practice reaching out to community-based organizations in their area to develop that relationship that way. So it wouldn't be a cold call to 211 or even just, you know, the places that you're referring most to from like Now Power Unite Us would be the people you also develop relationships with. So you could call them more directly or they may be even be willing to spend time in your practice at times. So there, that's, that's a great possibility for folks too. So Robin, tell us more about what Now Pow is. Some, some people in the audience may not know uh, what what that is yeah yeah well for, for some of us old social workers it's like the blue book they used to have in the chicago area with all the resources in it um what now pow has done and now it is called unitas um they really curate those resources and develop algorithms and connections so hopefully if you put in what the needs are the resources will pop up and um i love rachel to say a little more but something that we've all felt strongly about here is it's not enough to just give someone a referral that's generated from uh, Unite Us or Now Pow, but it's it's more critical to play the wraparound piece of it to make sure that that's the right referral for the person you're talking to and have that care management or more longitudinal component to make sure people get connected up. Rachel, any more technicality you can refer to around uh, Now Pow Unite Us? You know, the only thing that I would add is that it's certainly not a replacement. It's a tool. Uh, so it, it will never replace a human being connecting with another human being. But it certainly provides a lot more um, curated, as you said, uh, access to resources in the community that, that will benefit patients. So um, I think you hit, hit it on the head beautifully. Great. Thank you. But it's perfect that you reminded me about it's, it's a tool. It doesn't replace a human. Thank you. Great. Yeah, uh, fantastic. And I think the, um, as you said, Robin, and and very few uh, places probably um, have a social worker on site, um, you know, all the time in every clinic. But um, as was my experience, because we didn't have a, in our clinic at Rutt didn't have a social worker on site, but we got a got a human, a care manager, uh, a social worker on the phone. They made that connection. We closed the door. They had a, a moment of privacy, um, and and that was critical. Um, and I, I think stressing that it's the team because maybe the medical assistant is going to identify that social need uh, more readily than uh, that than the the clinician absolutely. or, or absolutely. the physician, and they feel, should feel empowered uh, certainly it, it as well. Absolutely, right? take the team effort for sure. Right. Um, what were some of the barriers um, to uh, identifying? I know you, you, all of you have been at this for a very long time, um, and I, and you've overcome quite a few barriers. But can you give the audience some uh, tips and and share your struggles and how you overcame them um, in this important work? I think the biggest I'm one. Oh, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> I was I was going to say, as an operations person and not a clinician. I would have to say that the, the primary challenge that I faced was role clarity. Um, as we would discuss, um, you know, rolling out social determinant screening, implementing it in the electronic medical record, 
um, it, it became very challenging um, and was a little frightening, I think, for clinicians to think, oh goodness, now here's one more thing to add to the long laundry list. And that would go all the way from the medical assistants to possibly nurses, to physicians, to everyone. And I think what we had to get really clear about is um, this is, you know, as much as we can empower our patients to conduct the screener themselves, if it's possible, that's probably the most ideal workflow, but also to make sure that all members of the care team recognize that it's, it takes a team and that there is not one piece of a workflow that should fall on and create burden for others. So just making sure that providers felt supported, that uh, social workers and care managers felt connected and that other, you know, everyone felt like there's the resources available and that everyone's job in this was very clear. I would say those were some of the most difficult challenges that we faced with operations. Great, we have a couple of questions in the chat unless uh, either of you had to add to Rachel's. So from the chat, uh, somebody asks, how do you vet or build trust with CBOs I'm not sure what that stands for. As community, you refer community, patients, what is, community based organizations. Community based organizations as you refer patients to be connected. Uh, I don't know who might want to yeah, take I, that I'm on. I'm happy to. Um, we, we have a whole Center for Health and Social Care Integration, or we call it CHASI, and we can send you some information on that if anyone's interested, that provides training and technical assistance for how CBOs can come together with hospitals. and or primary care or, or clinics anywhere. And really it takes, you can imagine being in a CBO if they got a call from a physician, how excited they would be, truly excited. And as long as they didn't feel, they felt they were part of the solution and not just become a place where everyone gets sent and we assume that they can pick it all up when you know most community-based organizations are struggling to keep their lights on. So if I were in a community-based social service agency and got a call, I would say, you know, be so excited. Let's sit down. Let's figure out how to develop this relationship. If at some point you get funding to do a social needs screening as a physician, how do you share some of that um, money that you achieved to maybe pay them for some of their time? All of that is happening across the country, very innovative ways. And, uh, we could get more into that detail that would take another hour or so. Great, and we have two more in the question and then I'm gonna come back to you, Dr. Zimmerman and talk about how do we find the time to do all this? Uh, because that is a, a key message that we're working on at the AMA. Um, we've just uh, published a playbook called uh, uh, Saving Time in Your Clinical Practice. But here are the two questions. One from Adam Blair, do all of your questionnaires populate to appropriate Z codes? And have you found limitations to this? I don't know who could answer that. Rachel or Robin, do you? Sure, I, I can. Um, you know, one of the slides that Dr. Zimmerman showed, which was really helpful, um, is that Z codes are mapped in our electronic medical record to the responses of the social determinant screener. And so they, they really do populate based on the results of the screen. So we make it automatic. Um, there is the ability to change that. So they're recommended. They're not you know, automatically going to be sent through if, if a provider doesn't think that they're appropriate. But um, we wanted to make that process as, as automatic as possible. Um, and so what we've seen is that it's, it's a great way to capture that data. Uh, and so, um, you know, the provider also has the ability to make uh, a referral to care management within that uh, that same smart set that, that was available. So we found that that's probably the most appropriate way to do so with uh, primary care practices. Um, we're looking at other ways to capture Z codes in other areas around the hospital, but I think that is probably the most seamless process. Yeah, I think developed. that's so important. And, and what I love what you're saying here is you default to the, you set the system to default to the least amount of clicks and, and use the power of the EHR to help things get done. So, you know, we don't want to say it's just one more click. No, default so that you don't even have to do the click and you can always opt out. 
uh, because autonomy is important as well uh, for the provider. But I, I love that the default is, is uh, that it is automatic. Another question in the uh, these great questions in the in the chat it, from Andrea Moore is limited health literacy often identified as an SDOH and barrier to positive clinical outcomes. If yes, how does Rush help address limited health literacy on the patient and organizational level? Who'd like to take that one on? I'm deferring to Dr. Zimmerman. How about, do you want to take that on? It's a tricky one. Health literacy? It is tricky. I mean, I think, you know, we try as as much as we can when we develop patient materials or we develop, um, you know, anything patient facing, we really try to follow the AHRQ health literacy universal precautions, right? So, it, it honestly, I'll be honest, I would have to defer to Robin, to, to Robin and, and um, our care management colleagues about concretely how we how we link people to let's say basic education. Um, I know we have many programs here though, like for instance the chronic disease management program, which could address some of this. We do, um, so I'll we let do. you I'll let you expand on that, Robin. Sure. I mean we have a lot of people, our social care and health equity group, which meets weekly, struggles with this and we have the health literacy expert at Rush on the phone and we all are very conscientious, but really it takes a person-centered approach. Doesn't matter what gets developed and what doesn't. People are not about to easily say, I don't understand what you're saying. So as much uh, empathy and understanding you can have toward that person in trying to under to get a sense of how they learn and you know how much their understanding of what they're learning is gonna make all the difference in the world. And sometimes we don't take the time to do that, but, but if we, seriously don't take the time so much of what we're doing will be not used and then we could interpret it as if they're not um you know wanting to be part of their care when indeed they're just not understanding it but rachel do you have anything more technically that we've tried to do um we have built in um questions in our social determinant screener just you know one initial question around that on our pediatric side um, and really focused on the parents' education as well. Um, but, you know, it, it's really specific to, to the pediatric area, not the adult area. I think, Robin, you really hit it on the head that it's really around the empathy and being able to address people um, at that moment um, and taking a patient-centered approach is critical. Mm -hmm. And here's another question from L. Cross. Can you share your experience with Open Notes and SDOH? Has the patient provider trust and relationship improved with common language on difficult issues, especially housing? I know we have a toolkit on open notes and the benefits. And I was one of those providers that thought, oh, this is going to take, add so much more time to my, uh, to my day. But I, I ended up loving having the notes available to the patient. It actually saved me time. Uh, but can uh, uh, Dr. Zimmerman or Robin or Rachel share your experience with open notes? Sure. Um, I mean, the open notes, I mean, a lot of clinicians have the same apprehension around open notes. I have to say my feedback from patients has been 100% positive. Um, people love to be able to look back at the note and see exactly what we talked about. And I think it it also sort of speaks to universal precautions for health literacy in that, um, you know, I think the, I think it it is incumbent upon the clinician, the doctor, to use plain language and to really break things down for the patient. And I tend to do that anyway in my notes and also in my patient instructions. And so um, it's actually been I've had zero negative feedback, and I do comment quite frequently on things like food insecurity, housing insecurity, um, even, you know, substance use disorder. And I've, I've had no negative feedback from patients. I think patients have really seen the open notes as, as a partnership. Of course, you know, there's a, fair amount, there's a fair amount of my patients who have screened positive for social determinants of health need um, and don't have internet reliably to access my chart reliably. So, you know, there, there is that component as well, but overall the people who have looked at their notes and have engaged me on their notes have been very positive about it. 
Right, and, and in my experience also similar, um, Dr. Zimmerman, was uh, I would do it right there with the patient in the room, uh, and I could turn to the patient and I would say, would it be all right if I said uh, that you had been using or that you, you know, have difficulty uh, finding uh, food? And they, you know, almost to everyone said, of course, of course. And it, if I was, if the patient wasn't with me, I would wonder, oh, should I would take more time? Yeah. Should I say that? If they're going to read it, would they be offended? And we have quite a few more questions and only about 10 minutes. So if we can keep our answers short. And please, uh, Alec, if you could put the contact information, we have a request for um, a speaker request form to invite the Health Literacy Lead and other members at uh, who are speaking Rush to speak to external organizations. Uh, we do have a speaker panel um, at the AMA, and I know our, our our fabulous experts on the call would be uh, would, would welcome any opportunities to to share their wisdom. Uh, so we'll put that those contact information into the um, uh, in, into the chat. Um, here's another one from uh, Bonnie Richardson. Every managed Medicaid subscriber is assigned a care coordinator. But with most plans, it's nearly impossible to actually connect to the patient's care coordinator or case manager. How do you navigate those barriers? Who wants to take that one? <laughs> um, it's Robin. I, you know, please the managed care people on the phone don't don't find out my address. But you know, this is part <laughs> of what's difficult in that they use that term care manager or care coordinator, but so often that person is more about looking at utilization and costs as opposed to providing the kind of care management that Dr. Zimmerman is describing and I'm describing and Rachel's describing. So that I wouldn't count on that totally. Um, so you're gonna get a lot of what you get from most insurance companies and plans, not the coordination we're talking about. So I'm not sure how to fix it other than call it what it is? You know, Robin and Rachel, you probably know more about this from a system standpoint than I do, but I recall a time when, so when Ma when Medicaid managed care first started right after the ACA, um, when the ACA was implemented, you know, only our county care, right? We've always had county care care managers in-house. So right. county care was willing to give funds to organizations to have their own care managers in-house. Um, how, I guess, any thoughts on how that could be brokered with the other managed care organizations? Is that on the horizon at all? Uh, somewhat. I mean, Rachel and I talk to a lot of companies all the time who are trying to, um, you know, learn what we've done. But I don't, I don't know. It's a really good question. That that why that happened is they believed that by having true care management, it will total, it would overall not only provide people with well-being and quality of life and better care, but also in the same way reduce costs. So that was, that's, that's just what people have to believe and then jump from there. And then another, um, one other thing I would say um, for Bonnie Richardson, I mean, we're really, really lucky at Rush and actually my, the, the, the FQHC that I worked at for a time did this as well, where we started with care managers for certain people who were in certain managed care organizations and we had those care managers on site. But eventually the institution realized that it, it was instrumental to expand it so that we actually have a care management team that can take on all of our patients walking through the door, regardless of what insurance, you know, what ACO they're part of or what managed care Medicaid program they're part of or what MMAI they're part of. Um, and so like Rush has expanded those services. So now it doesn't matter who their insurer is, any patient in my clinic has access to our care management and social work and, services. And, and, yeah, and those um, are mostly managed, you know, masters prepared social workers. It's really yes. important to know the investment we've made in that. Great, we have one, one more question and then we'll send it back to you to, to share, um, you know, your, your takeaway points. Uh, Dr. Zimmerman, what what is the patient's reaction generally to this, uh, to, to being asked these questions? And what if they say, "No, I'm all right." What do you what do you do? Um, uh, if you know, what's what's the response of most of the patients? I mean, most of the patients are incredibly um, 
again, positive, collaborative. They seem relieved when these are brought up during the clinic visit. <clears throat> the case that I shared, you know, the woman said, well, yes, you know, I do have problems affording food <clears throat> and I do run out of resources paycheck to paycheck. And by the end of the month, sometimes I can't afford to go to the grocery store. <clears throat> and so, you know, in a lot of cases, people are relieved that it's been brought up there. They want help. They want resources. I mean, there are, sometimes it's challenging because there are patients that will say, yeah, you know, that doesn't really apply to me or I don't, I don't really need help. I got it, doc. I'll be fine. And I think for those people, it's still really important to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, make the resources available and sort of um, <clears throat> let them access them and really meet them where they are and let them access it on their own time. <clears throat> okay, and I'll, I'll let you grab a glass of water um, as we as we uh, finalize here and sum up, uh, Robin. Um, yes. Any closing comments? Yeah, and then I just I just uh, commend the AMA and I commend everyone that's attended today because you're on the path. It may not be an easy path all the time. Rachel can say we've had lots of fits and starts. You have to look for champions like Dr. Zimmerman to help you along that path, but it is ultimately the right thing to do, and we know that other countries that invest in social care, their overall health comes improve, and that's a bottom line. We don't need to talk about the why anymore, as Rachel and I say, we just talk about the how we're gonna do it. So thank you for this opportunity. And Rachel? I mean, how do you follow comments? that up? <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely agree. Um, I'm so thankful to work at an institution that believes so strongly in social care uh, and has such champions like Dr. Zimmerman, like Robin Golden and others who really push this work forward. It's really critical for the health of our communities uh, to focus on social determinants of health. So I'm very thankful that the MA uh, invited us to speak today and I appreciate the time to share my uh, labor of love. Yeah, and I and I think that's a wonderful closing because I, I can sense the joy that your work brings to your day to day. Um, and in this time post COVID where uh, providers are, are feeling such burnout and uh, the challenges are so great being able to provide this and make a difference in somebody's life like the case you started with Dr. Zimmerman, uh, I'm sure when she comes in and the whole team recognizes how uh, you met her needs. It's fantastic. So we're going to wrap up and remind the audience to check out the content that's listed in the resources widget on your console. Um, and we have lots of additional resources. Again, uh, stepsforward.org is, is on the slide now. You don't need to be an AMA member. You don't need to give us an email. 1.4 million unique users are downloading these 70 toolkits to save time. Uh, address equity, uh, implement annual prescription renewal, um, uh, pre-visit planning, address diabetes in a, in a, in a, in a time-saving fashion, manage the EHR inbox. So please avail yourself of that. Again, you don't need to be a physician. You don't need to be an A member. They're completely free. This is all mission driven. Um, there'll be a brief survey will pop up in your window. We really appreciate it. If you would take the time to answer those questions, there's very few. Uh, because, of course, your responses will help guide the next uh, programming. And the, all of the speakers would welcome any opportunity to speak to your group or continue the conversation. We also have a mentoring program. We could continue some time saving um, and other uh, 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 tools that you'll see and help you guide your clinic to, uh, to get started, because that's often the, the, the hard part or to convince somebody um, locally the importance of this. So again, thank you for joining us. And we hope again to see you soon in another webinar. And thank you to our wonderful speakers. <laughs>